Human Rights Watch says Kurdish forces in Iraq are destroying Arab homes. They're being accused of expanding their territory in areas retaken from ISIL. So is this about settling old scores? And what does it mean for Iraq's future? This is Inside Story. Hello and welcome to the program. I'm Martine Dennis. Unlawful retaliation, that's what Iraqi Kurdish forces are being accused of. Human Rights Watch says they're destroying large numbers of Arab homes and even whole villages in northern Iraq in what may amount to a war crime. Now the rights group says there's evidence of further destruction during the latest offensive in Mosul. Kurdish Peshmerga forces are part of an Iraqi alliance helped by US-led airstrikes that's battling to retake control of Mosul from ISIL. Now, Human Rights Watch says Kurdish forces have destroyed homes in areas that have been taken from ISIL over the past two years. It says the destruction was in retaliation for what the Kurds believe was Arab communities' support for ISIL. Kurdish homes, though, were apparently left intact. The Kurdish authorities say they abide by human rights laws and that some villages were damaged by the ferocity of the fighting. Human Rights Watch is also accusing Kurdish and Iraqi forces of detaining at least 37 men suspected of being linked to ISIL. While Kurds make up the fourth largest ethnic group in the Middle East, they've faced years of repression in their quest for an independent state. In the late 1970s, the Iraqi government was said to have settled Arabs in areas with Kurdish majorities, particularly around the oil-rich city of Kirkuk, and forcibly relocating the Kurds, so-called Arabization. In 1988, Saddam Hussein unleashed a campaign of vengeance on the Kurds that included the poison gas attack on Halabja. When Iraq was weakened in the aftermath of the 1991 Gulf War, the Kurds led a rebellion which saw them enjoy a temporary period of self-rule with a no-fly zone in the north. But after ISIL captured large parts of northern Iraq in 2014, the Peshmerga were sent into disputed areas claimed by the Kurds and called on the Kurdish parliament to plan a referendum on independence. All right, let's bring in our guests now. They are all in a bill today. We have Joe Stork, Deputy Director of Human Rights Watch, Middle East and North Africa Division. Judith Neurink, who's an Erbil-based journalist and founder of the Independent Media Centre in the Kurdish region of northern Iraq. And we have Dindar Zabari. He's Deputy Minister with the Kurdistan Regional Government. Welcome to you all. Can I start with you, Mr Zabari? Uh, you're accused of quite serious uh, atrocities, uh, serious allegations that could possibly constitute a war crime or at least a breach of international humanitarian law, demolishing Arab homes and even... Uh, whole Arab villages. What does the Kurdish regional government have to say to that? Thank you for this opportunity. I believe <laughs> this is very uh, a new allegation, <laughs> a genocide and uh, carried out by forces from the region. Definitely not. We reject. We reject this. Uh, uh, the title of the report. We reject the uh, intention uh, um, draft that has been drafted a while ago but of course uh, has been highlighted in a very I have to say tough language which is uh, uh, bearing in, in, in mind the responsibility towards the destruction of the Arab houses definitely not we certainly reject them there are there are millions of Arab uh, Sunni Arabs in Iraqi Kurdistan accommodated by Kurdistan region liberation of the areas that have been liberated uh, not to do with Arab or, to, or the Kurdish population it was a, a, a process of, of liberation conducted by Peshmerga forces with the help of coalition forces and uh, there are factors that have had led to a sort of um, few destructions in few houses or in few villages and we have explained that in our last communication with human rights organization with many other colleagues international partners uh, and, I've, and I have to and I have to say here details of more than three 
300 villages have been circulated to Human Rights Watch organization, and also details and numbers and a number of the houses. Reasons have been various from uh, area to area, and it's not that far in, in, in 120, 21 sites that have been identified by Human Rights Organization. I have to say we have visited more than 100 of the sites, uh, and it's very much, very much founded contrary what has been highlighted. It might be cases and individual uh, behaviors, but of course, uh, out of the KRG, uh, uh, conducted by different militants or conducted by different uh, villages, citizens themselves, that KRG Peshmerga forces tried their best to stop and protect the civilians. And I have to say, the more organized, unified, with instructions, Peshmerga forces have been a success story. All right. I have to say, for the last okay. two years towards the liberation. Let's go to Human Rights Watch now. Let's go to Joe Stork. So, categoric denial, refuting the allegations that these things are happening under the auspices of the Peshmerga in the first instance and the Kurdish regional government in the other. Yeah, look, I've heard this from before from Mr. Dindar, Dr. Dindar. We met earlier this week and had this discussion. Uh, our report, uh, I, I hope readers will, your, your viewers will consult our website and look directly at the report and see what we have to say. We documented extensive destruction in 83 villages, looking deeply uh, into the case of 21 villages. What we found in every case was extensive destruction, sometimes whole villages, uh, that happened after Peshmerga or Kurdish uh, security forces generally were in full control of the area. In other words, there was no battle going on anymore. Maybe there had been a battle, but it was over. Uh, there were no airstrikes anymore. We can tell the difference. You can, if you look at two buildings, one destroyed by an airstrike, one destroyed by a bulldozer, you can tell the difference, okay? And we're talking about buildings that were destroyed by bulldozers, that were set on fire, uh, that were indeed set off by explosives from the, that were left in booby traps from the Islamic State people. Uh, but all of this is destruction that happened after the Peshmerga were in control. And, and in addition, we're looking at cases Sorry? No, OK, let me go to Judith now. Uh, Judith, as a, a, a journalist who's operated in the region for some time, what's your perspective of what exactly has been going on? Well, it, we have reports from different sources about destruction. And I have seen villages like that myself when I was near to the Mosul Dam uh, a number of months ago. Now, sometimes it's very clear these are villages that have been destroyed because there were ISIS guys inside uh, it, the village was mainly part of isis but for other villages it sometimes is not so clear recently villages have been destroyed near to kirkuk as we hear from a number of sources uh, and in that case uh, it seems also there is a connection to isis because the uh, at attack uh, in, in kirkuk a couple of weeks ago um, is supposed to have been organized from there so it's, it's a bit of a mixed bag, to put it that way. Um, Mr. Zabari, this is not the first time that Kurdish forces are being accused of treating Arab villagers unfairly. The Kirkuk instance is another example where Peshmerga forces were accused of, after having uh, kicked out ISIL, uh, of, of mistreating uh, the Arab uh, the Arab residents of Kirkuk, many of whom, of course, were IDPs and had fled conflict in other parts of the country. Uh, and that is something you deny. But also last year, Amnesty International came up with a re uh, report which documented these allegations against Kurdish forces yet again. Yeah. Uh, I don't see any difference here between Amnesty International and Human Rights Watch organization. Very much copy paste, but uh, uh, in terms of Kirkuk province, uh, as uh, it has been very much uh, indicated, uh, there were two villages, Kushkaya and Qutan, recently. In Qutan itself, members of the uh, of the village or villages themselves, they were members of ISIL. Where from the, from those houses, uh, uh, Daesh or ISIL have taken place defense position, attacked Peshmerga forces, took the snipers from the top of the houses and attacked the Peshmerga forces. They were in those houses 
houses, we found the chemical weapons preparations. We find some of the houses, plenty of under 175 tons of TNT in some of those houses. And they were, they were the Amir of Daesh's, and they were the head and the leaders of the attacks of Daesh throughout the road of Kirkuk and Dubs for many months. But come back to uh, Kirkuk for itself, the, 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 the IDPs within the Kirkuk, they were again, uh, first of the arrival of the ISIL, 21st of October, they were the, the, the one that have received the ISIL fighters, have attacked from their position, from those areas, and from that specific location. And of course, Kurdish forces have taken position trying to uh, take out the, 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 the remaining of the, of, the, of the affiliation members. Okay, Mr. But Zabari, can I, can, I just, policy, can I just interject there, Mr. Zabari, because the problem is, is that there's a lot of suspicion surrounding uh, Kurdish actions. On the one hand, you're applauded, you're, you're commended for your uh, fierce fighting and your successes against ISIL, but there's a great deal of suspicion as to what the Kurdish regional government wants in return, and i.e. more land in reward for their actions against ISIL. I mean, is this the case, that you're actually see, using the fog of war to, to take more land, more territory, by stealth? At all not, at all not. I don't think there is a need to take uh, these areas or, 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 or locations uh, forcefully throughout the Daesh process. Definitely not. Uh, some of the villages have been liberated by Peshmerga forces. They are nothing to do with the disputed areas. They're out of the disputed areas. Peshmerga forces sacrifices were not for the disputed areas. Uh, it's to, 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 turn to, to stop the, 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 the advance of the organization. In the, and indeed, but Kirkuk is, uh, is very much a disputed city isn't it? Kirkuk with all of its oil wells surrounding it. Whatever decision made at the level of Kirkuk governorate, head of the security of Kirkuk, it's the governor of Kirkuk. Within the governorate of Kirkuk, there's a council of the governorate where composed of Turkmen's, Arabs, uh, uh, Christians, and, 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 and Kurds. Decision of security made jointly, and whatever transfer has happened in terms of IDPs to a new location, it was a joint, joint decision, again supported by the Iraqi prime minister and Iraqi House of Representatives. And uh, Judith, uh, the deputy minister has a point insofar as there are, they are hosting, the Kurdish government is ho hosting, what, two and a half million uh, Arab citizens who fled from ISIL and other kinds of conflict. So um, how do uh, Kurds and Arabs get on in the Kurdish region on a daily basis? Well, also that is different in different places. Uh, for instance, in Erbil, where we are, there are many Arabs who already live here quite a while, came from, from Baghdad, came from a different areas, and you have a lot of IDPs who came in more recently. Now, today when I came here, I saw on the road a truck from Anbar. They were taking uh, the, um, the furniture of people back to go back to Anbar. So there's also already people going back. Um, the Kurds are doing an enormous job uh, taking care of all these over two million refugees um, and, and most of them are looked after well but there are a lot of checkpoints uh, and at the checkpoints you have special ones for the Arabs which doesn't um, it doesn't give a good idea and it is not taken very well by the Arabs living here um, there are problems in between when ISIS was very near to Erbil two years ago um, there were riots inside the city of young Kurds who were trying to, to get all the Arabs out of Erbil because they were blaming them for being ISIS. So it is a very sensitive issue. So coming back to you, Joe Stalk, a very sensitive issue. And yes. uh, the Kurdish regional government, uh, again, completely denies any of these atrocities that you're accusing it yes, of. Look. Let me, let, me, let me go back to the case of the village of Kutan, which uh, Dr. Dindar raised. I brought it to his attention when we met last Wednesday. I had been there the day before, so Tuesday, November 8th. This is a village that before October 21st, there had been no uh, Islamic State action whatsoever. Uh, in two days, October 22nd, 23rd, the village was leveled, and I mean leveled by bulldozers uh, un when the village was under Peshmerga or Asayish control. The, on October 21st, 
The Peshmerga rounded up the men of the village, 70 or so men, brought them to their base, held them for several days, questioned them, and let them all go. So not a single person was suspected oh, of right. activity but with Islamic could, State. No, could this, be, Sorry, no, could, could this be the action? Could, no. could this be the action of, of particular units, of individuals, as the Deputy Minister has suggested? This well, is yes, what I'm trying to was, get from you. Of, of, okay, yes, good point. It was obviously the action of particular units. And this gets to the point of Dr. Dindar uh, mentioned that individual commanders may be doing the wrong thing. But we've seen individual commanders doing the wrong thing for several years, repeatedly, and there's been nothing done about it. So the, the, the government of the KRG makes some very fine statements, as Mr. Dindar did here today, about uh, the KRG policy. It does not include uh, violations of this sort, but yet these violations repeat themselves, and yet no one, no Pesh commander that I'm aware of, has been investigated or disciplined or, uh, or suspended from his rank uh, because of what's happening. So I would challenge Dr. Dindar here this afternoon to tell me, to tell us that there will be an investigation of the leveling of the village of Kutan and that the person or persons responsible will be held accountable. Will you take up that challenge, Dr. Dindar? Over to you, Mr. Zabari. Yes, uh, we have had that discussion with Joyce Sorg. Yes, true. Um, there are not um, any claims brought uh, to the attention of the government of KRG against any chief commander of the forces. Uh, if there were any international organization have brought that uh, claim, we would definitely will look at it and see the background, I, the I details just, of the case. So far, I Sorry, just brought that if claim. you brought it right now, through the, uh, if you if you if if you brought it right now, and if you can please give me the full details and full complaint and full claim so we can work on it. This is a legal matter more than me yes, to decide I, who has I to gave be blamed it, I gave it to, to you. be blamed. I gave it to you. I gave it, I gave it to you when we met on Wednesday. If you give it to me on Wednesday, you don't expect for me within two days, I make everything, all the details available. And I think we have a legal system in Kurdistan. It's not for a journalist in an international organization like your organization to, to predict and then to have a conclusion and conclude everything. I think it depends on the scenarios, sorry, it depends on the situation, on the challenges, military challenges, and details are hundreds, are not only one single mind or one single sided accusation. Uh, Dr. Uh, Zabari, uh, these accusations have been around for a while. You don't seem to be meeting these accusations. These are besmirching the reputation of the Peshmerga, of the Kurdish regional government, that was commended uh, particularly for taking on ISIL and rescuing uh, the Yazidi people in particular. Just two years ago, you liberated Sinjar. We have not rescued Yazidi people. We have rescued all Iraqis, uh, including Arab Sunnis. Uh, and there are no other no, there are no other units like Peshmerga forces that have been so far not only success but have protecting the Iraqi areas and the Iraqi people. This is what, in terms of the accusation, it repeated yes by the same organization, by the two two organization, Amnesty and Human Rights Watch organization. We have proposed of UNAMI, United Nations. There are a lot of details, but it's not to popular to, to, to politicize the situation and to generalize the few cases on the whole situation. We want human rights organization also to look at hundreds of other villages and hundreds of other liberated areas. It's not only about 21 sites. There are, there are cases of 500 villages we have supplied. So I think what is happening here are details and I think technical issues are very much relevant. Military operation and technicality of the, of the, of the operation is very much relevant here. And I don't think it's very much to do with the human rights breaches. KRG has been the only, organ the only government in this region has asked for international criminal tribunal, Iraq, to be part of it, has asked for Iraq to be a member of the law high treatment, and has also requested the missions of human rights organization of the UN to visit the areas. We have facilitated the work of Joyce Strzok in this region. We have facilitated and gave all the access to the international organizations to meet sorry, and, and to visit these areas. There is nothing to be hided. Everything has been transparent enough. Reasons have been explained. And I don't think one village or two villages can be, can be identified. Without a little bit, I have to say, details. Details have to be very much scrutinized, very much looked at. It. And then decision, legal decision, must be made by the court and by judicial authority, not by me and Joyce Stork. 
OK, what about the villages then that the Peshmerga have successfully cleared of ISIL? The villages that particularly are of mixed or of Sunni Arab uh, populations. What is happening to those? Are you prepared to give those back to the original inhabitants or are you prepared to keep them as part of a, a, a greater Kurdish area? It's, it's very much, it's very much, I have to say, a, a different environment created by some of these organizations. Definitely not. We have more than, I have to say, um, a million IDPs, but I have to say around the provinces of Nainawa, Kirkuk, Diyala, Mahmur, and Guer, you have hundreds of the Arab villages. How can you take back these villages? These people are now in Kurdistan region. They have to go back, and we have supported them to go back. There are dozens of villages people went back. But in a city like Guer, which is part of the sub-district of, district of Mahmur, half of the population where the Kurd are the Kurdish population, none of them are able to go back. And the reason because of basic services, fear of artillery of ISIL, fear of the rockets of ISIL, and fear of the, of the devices, explosive devices, as well as the security of their own children and families. So it's nothing to do with Arab few villages or Kurdish few villages. It's a, it's a whole process of re reconstruction, rebuilding, as well as basic services, and beyond that also security and, uh, and the fear of ISIL or return of ISIL. Uh, Judith, then, uh, given what the Deputy Minister has just said, why is there so much lingering suspicion surrounding the territorial ambitions of the KRG? Um, because, is, of course, we all is. know that uh, the, Kurdish, the Kurdish area um, is, uh, is not, uh, it doesn't feel complete to the Kurds. There is this, this disputed areas that... Um, uh, they even put on their own dream maps. And um, even uh, the uh, president, Barzani, has said that the uh, land that the Peshmerga is now uh, uh, conquering is going to be for Kurdistan. Um, we know that uh, near Karamlish, uh, near to Mosul, at the moment the Peshmerga is making a trench which some people think might be the new border. And the problem is that the perception of this for a lot of the Arab community, whether here or outside, is that the courts want more land. And even if it isn't true, then even so, the Kurdish authorities should realize that this is the perception, that this is what is the message that's going there. And that message is a very uh, dangerous one, because ISIS was built on uh, the fact that the Sunni population felt they were discriminated, they were done out. And if this is being done by another group, then again this feeling of, uh, yeah, of, of, of discrimination uh, is, is, might cause a lot of problems. And uh, Mr. Zabari, what exactly is the status then of the well-known and long-held ambition of the Kurds of northern Iraq for an independent homeland. Where is that uh, aspiration now? Are you still on course? Are you still pushing to secede from uh, Greater Iraq? Uh, I think, let me explain here. First of all, those areas that have been liberated recently and within the last two years, these are areas that KRG forces were present prior to ISIL arrival, prior to Daesh arrival. This is one. Uh, second, uh, uh, in terms of the ambitions of the Kurdish uh, uh, leadership or Kurdish people, certainly self-determination has been a, 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 a right and a Kurdish aspirations always have been, have been there and I think it, has to do, it will depend on the time and the circumstances and of course the decision has to be made by the people of Kurdistan. And then on the third point, President Barzani's statement on the areas that have been liberated, uh, I, I know detail of that statement. The statement was very much to do with the, uh, the sacrifices Peshmerga forces were doing, and even the latest agreement with Baghdad and coalition very much to do with advance of Peshmerga forces in those line areas that are very much present of Peshmerga were in the past present, or they were there in the past. But to do with the withdraw or not withdraw, I believe it has to go through the referendum, and I think legal, legal 
uh, document Iraqi constitution, very clear example to that. That constitution, that article still is valid. The UN is very much supportive of that article. A referendum to be held. We have been asking back that for 20, for more than 11 years to hold the census referendum and then and then and all normalization of situation. But nothing to do with the war against ISIL. ISIL war is completely different, different idea. In Kirkuk, Arab tribal leaders are in line with the Peshmerga force have took an arm against ISIL on the 21st of October and fight it ISIL. It's completely two different stories here. Okay, thank you all very much indeed. Deputy Minister Zebari, Judith Neurink and Joe Stork, thank you very much for taking part in this conversation. And as ever, thank you for watching. You can see the programme anytime again by going to the Al Jazeera website. If you want more discussion, you can go to our Facebook page, facebook.com forward slash AJ Inside Story. And there's a Twitter sphere, our handle at AJ Inside Story. But from me, Martine Dennis, and the whole team here in Doha, it's bye for now.